The first months of 1924 see great leaders and institutions pass into history with huge displays of public grief. But this winter also sees something new being born. On a wintry day in Manhattan, a relatively unknown Broadway composer enters the concert hall to perform to an audience gathered to hear the cutting edge of modern music. His music captures the spirit of the 1920s. Intellectuals and flappers alike are already calling these tumultuous times the jazz age, but this age now has a soundtrack with the premiere of George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, Jazz Music Goes Mainstream. This is Between Two Wars Season 2, a chronological summary of the interwar years, where we cover the zeitgeist, the culture, the technology, the art, the sports, and much more in the era when, for better or worse, humanity ushered in modern times. I'm Indy Nidell. The new year has brought little change for Germany and the broader reparations crisis. The separatist movement in the Rhineland is now driving a wedge between Britain and France. Britain is wary of a new independent republic and wants an independent League of Nations committee to investigate things. France supports the separatist movement, knowing it will weaken Germany and create a new buffer state in the middle of Europe. France can't afford any more instability, though. Its economy is in chaos, and the franc is plummeting in value. However, the committee responsible for fixing this reparations crisis has now arrived in Berlin to begin their work. Looking beyond these squabbles, Yugoslavia and Italy have signed the Treaty of Rome, settling their territorial dispute around Fiume. The region is divided between them with joint administration of port town harbors. While all of this is going on, both America and the Soviet Union enter periods of mourning. Former President Woodrow Wilson has passed away, and so has Vladimir Lenin, leader of the world's first communist state. I've already spoken about the final months of Woodrow Wilson in the last episode, and there's not much new to say here. I haven't looked at Lenin for a while, though. As you'll know from the spring of 1922, basically everyone else around him knew he was dying. He suffered another stroke in 1923 and lost his ability to speak. Finally, on January 21st this year, Lenin slips into a coma and dies of a brain hemorrhage. Shortly before his death, he requested his body be buried next to his mother in the Volkovskoye Cemetery in Petrograd, a cemetery filled with intellectuals. That does not happen. The government has been running without him for a while, but in the eyes of the public, Lenin has been the unquestioned leader of the Soviet state. The Politburo know they need a major ceremony to live up to his legacy, and there is genuine grief at his death. As leader, Lenin had readily used terror to protect his Soviet state, and even during his ill health, he ordered the mass shooting of Orthodox clergy. However, the statewide week of mourning sees mass demonstrations in his honor throughout the country, and thousands flock to see the somber parade transport his body from his dasha in Gorky, despite the freezing temperatures. Upon arrival in Moscow, the body is moved to the House of the Unions to lie in state. On January 27th, it is ceremonially placed in a small wooden mausoleum in the Kremlin Wall Necropolis. Prominent figures like Mikhail Kalinin, Grigory Zinoviev, and Joseph Stalin take part in the ceremony. Though notably, Leon Trotsky is not present. According to him, Stalin gave him the wrong date for the ceremony. Well, for the next six weeks, over 100,000 people from all over the country will make their way through the small death chamber to catch a glimpse of the Soviet figurehead. Apparently, some peasants cross themselves following Orthodox Christian tradition as they pass the body, an action causing the sentries on watch to yell, this is not a church, there are no saints here. That's not exactly true. Lenin is being made into a type of communist saint by the Politburo. His likeness is everywhere. Homes, railway stations, offices, all honor the death of their leader. By March, the Soviet government is still divided on what to do with Lenin's body, though. Eventually, they decide to abandon the prospect of burial entirely. The authority entrusted with organizing the burial ceremony is renamed the Immortalization Commission. On March 26, 
The temporary mausoleum is torn down to make way for a more long-term one designed by famed architect Alexei Shchusev. It will be opened this summer. In keeping with the craze for all things classical in these years, the monumental structure will be reminiscent of ancient mausoleums like the Tomb of Cyrus and the Steppe Pyramid. The increasing cult of Lenin is really a story for another time. For now, in America, a Manhattan audience witnesses musical history being made. It is at a concert in the Aeolian Hall organized by Paul Whiteman, a famous band leader who dreams of bringing jazz into the concert hall. Beyond being a particularly hot form of dance music originating in black communities, no one can quite agree on what jazz is. In general, it's a word that has come to symbolize the modern age. F. Scott Fitzgerald's 1922 collection of short stories, Tales of the Jazz Age, are much more about the lives of wealthy Americans and industrial society than the music itself. But what jazz definitely isn't is an art form, at least according to the traditional white music establishment. To them, it is seen as crude, disreputable in its racial origins, and far removed from the European concert hall tradition. Whiteman wants to change this. Celebrated as the king of jazz, Whiteman has built his name as a man of symphonic jazz, a much more polished version of the music that sidelines improvisation and brings in orchestral colors from European classical music. Whiteman agrees that jazz was once crass and unartful, but he believes he has successfully tamed it to become the new American musical tradition. To prove this, he's rented out the Aeolian and used his name for a well-organized publicity campaign for his concert and experiment in modern music. Opening February 12th, it's a sold-out show, packed with everyone from flappers to highbrow critics to opera stars. The program mixes parodies of the supposed depravity of early jazz with showcases of the symphonic potential it has. By most accounts, the music is well-received, despite not quite having the gigantic impact Whiteman hoped it would, but that changes when a relatively unknown Broadway composer walks on stage to play piano for a jazz concerto he has written specifically for this concert. An otherworldly upward wail on the clarinet opens the piece. Straight away, his audience is enthralled by George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. With Gershwin's virtuoso piano at the fore, the Rhapsody moves from bombastic orchestral stride to driving dance passages to luscious and sentimental melodies. The audience rewards it with tumultuous applause and the demand for multiple encores. Gershwin has captured the potential of symphonic jazz in a way Whiteman was never able to. His Broadway sensibilities create an accessible piece with ear-pleasing motifs that sits comfortably within a serious orchestral setting. The blues harmony, syncopation, and high-spirited fun of it all also make it hot enough to capture that unique jazz sound. It rockets Gershwin to fame. Whiteman takes his experiment on a sold-out national tour with the Rhapsody as the showstopper. And the two musicians' recording of it in the summer will quickly sell around a million copies. His composition will also make Gershwin a wealthy man. Within 10 years, various performing and royalty fees will earn him more than a quarter of a million dollars, roughly equivalent to $4 million in 2021. There are still critics who see it as too low-brown, and even his most adoring reviewers point out the signs of immaturity in the piece. Still, it will be perhaps the most famous concert work of the 20th century. As noted critic Carl Van Vechten writes to Gershwin just days after attending the premiere, the concert, quite as a matter of course, was a riot, and you crowned it with what after repeated hearings, I am forced to regard as the foremost serious effort by any American composer. Go straight on, and you will knock all Europe silly. Far away from New York, something else is passing into history this season. The Turkish National Assembly has abolished the Ottoman Caliphate. I have covered the demise of the Ottoman Empire fairly extensively in season one. The Ottoman Caliphate is, or rather was, something different. Gone now 
is the most widely recognized custodian of Islam, one that has existed for centuries. Caliphates are a hugely important part of the Islamic faith. The Caliph is considered the successor to the Prophet Muhammad, and so leader of the entire Muslim world. The Ottoman Caliphate has long held one of the most legitimate claims to this succession, at least to Sunni Muslims, that is, by far the largest branch of Islam and the official religion of the Ottoman state. Since at least the 16th century, the sultans proclaimed caliphal authority. Territorially speaking, there was, initially, little argument to be made otherwise. They controlled the four holiest sites of Islam, Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem, and Damascus. And the capitals of former caliphates like Cairo and Baghdad. The sultanate clung to this religious authority even as the power of the Ottoman Empire started to wane. The watershed came after the Russo-Turkish War. The losing Ottomans had to cede territory and influence to Russia, most notably the Crimean Khanate, the first Muslim territory they had ever lost. But the treaty also guaranteed the Sultan's continued religious jurisdiction over the Muslims living there. As their caliph, he would have his name mentioned during Friday prayers and at religious festivals, and officials of the Sharia courts would be approved by Istanbul or Constantinople. The treaty ensured the spiritual idea of the caliphate lived on, something which remained the case even as the fortunes of the Ottoman Empire continued to worsen. Successive sultans said all Muslims, or at the very least Sunni Muslims, bore a personal responsibility to them. Naturally, that idea had opposition, but the vast majority of Sunnis did look to the caliph as their spiritual guardian. During the Great War, the Ottoman Empire tried to capitalize on this loyalty with the proclamation of a jihad against the Allied powers. Muslims beyond the borders did not rise up. Still, sympathy remained high in Muslim countries. Even when the Turkish War of Independence began in 1919, many believed the Turkish national movement fought the Allies to preserve the Caliphate. Some even hoped the leader of the movement, Mustafa Kemal, might become caliph himself. These hopes were in vain, however. The Grand National Assembly was established in Ankara in April 1920 and quickly set about dismantling the structures of the old Ottoman state. First, in November 1922, the assembly passed a motion abolishing the Ottoman Sultanate and thus the empire. Sultan Mehmed VI was exiled, but his first cousin continued as caliph in a purely ceremonial role. This lasts only while Kemal consolidates his personal power, however. On March 3rd, this year, 1924, he engineers the assembly to abolish the caliphate and expel all members of the Ottoman dynasty from Turkey. And just like that, one of the most widely recognized authorities on global Islam is gone. It creates a profound sense of loss across the Muslim world. Newspapers and sermons from Bosnia to Borneo decry what the Turks have done. British officials report on the widespread shock in the Muslim territories they administer. Egyptian High Commissioner Lord Edmund Allenby observes in a report, attempts to justify the action of Mustafa Kemal and his government are not tolerated, and the present Turkish policy is characterized as religious Bolshevism which, if pursued, will rob Turkey of her claim to a place among Islamic nations of the world. More poetically, an Indian cleric, Mohammed Barakatullah, writes this same month, an institution hallowed with traditions of 13 centuries, an embodiment of might and grandeur of the Orient in the eyes of European nations, and a shield of defense for Islam during the last 400 years, passed away as if in the twinkling of an eye. This edifice, which looked as firm as a rock and promised to last as long as the world would last, was swept away by the flood of phenomena. Is the earth of faith shaken by a terrible shock? And are the mountains of beliefs crumbled to pieces and diffused in the air like dust? With that, I will end the winter of 1924 with the death of a revolutionary, the death of a caliphate, and the ever-continuing rise of the Jazz Age. The big elephant in the room throughout Whiteman's quest to make jazz respectable is that you know, he didn't really stop to think that 
Maybe it doesn't need to sound like it belongs in a concert hall. Whiteman does have a lot of respect for black jazz musicians, but while he's trying to prove to concert critics that he has tamed jazz, the hot dance bands they look down on are pushing the potential of what the music can be beyond anything else before. Most notably, the still young Louis Armstrong will join the prestigious Fletcher Henderson and his orchestra this year and transform what it means to be a jazz soloist. He will do this without the help of the symphonic jazz heard at the Aeolian this February. At the same time though, that concert has exploded jazz into the mainstream and the music's newfound respectability will prompt people to dig deeper into what it promises. In a few years time, Armstrong, Coleman Hawkins, Duke Ellington and more will all fly to fame, providing the soundtrack to the restless and raucous jazz age. If you would like to refresh yourself on the politics of the establishment of the Turkish Republic, you can check out our extremely long season one episode on that right here. If you have had your eye on my tie, you can go to Indy's Tie Barn and perhaps own it for yourself. And if you've ever had the desire to wear a swimsuit with my face on it, oh yes, you can also purchase such amazing items at, uh, and our other Time Coast collectibles at the Time Ghost Barracks. That's our store. 50% of the revenue goes directly back into making all our content. And speaking of funding content, our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Carl Lee Justice III. It is our Time Ghost Army who are responsible for the bulk of our financing. So be like Carl, who I really, really hope is related to Sheriff Buford T. Justice from Smokey and the Bandit. Really hope so, even though he's a fictional character. And join the army at timeghost.com or Patreon, timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Sorry. And you know, Lenin once famously said, any cook should be able to run the country. Doesn't even need a toast. That's good enough. Thank <laughs> you.